Southeastern Fly presents the Angler's Influence Podcast with guest and owner of Southern Brookies, Susan Thrasher. Susan, welcome to Influence. Hey David, thanks for having me. All right, Susan, you're, you are a busy, busy person here. So you're the owner of Southern Brookies. Yes. Fly fishing here on the Caney Fork River. Mm-hmm. So with that, you have your own school where you teach people to fly fish. That's right. You have uh, overnight stays. Mm-hmm. You guide out of a drift boat. Do you wade guide any? I do. I do some wade fishing, um, not only on the Caney Fork, but on the, um, the Elk River. And, and then some of the winter stocking programs that TWRA has, I like to go out on some of the little streams and take folks out there too. Okay, so you almost have a full schedule there, but then you're also the... Uh, uh, retreat coordinator? Retreat for, leader for retreat Casting leader. for Recovery. Yeah. So retreat leader for Casting for Recovery. You're the co-founder and president of the Music City Fly Girls. That's right, since 2007. Wow. Yeah. Plus, if that's not enough, uh, you're a staff instructor at the Wolf School of Fly Fishing. That's right. I've done that for the last 14 years, which has really been something. That's So you have a full schedule. Yes. Your schedule's about like mine. And people think I'm retired. <laughs> <laughs> I think I work harder now than I've ever worked. That's what everybody says once they, once they quote unquote retire. Yeah. All right. So just to give everybody a little background about what we're doing here, we're, Susan's got a lot of stuff going on, and what we want to talk about in, in Influence is just who influenced her fly fishing career. Not necessarily the businesses and all the stuff that she's involved in, but we all kind of get into fly fishing and inevitably somebody makes a, makes a, an impact on us. And sometimes it's even before fly fishing. Sometimes it's early in life. Uh, but as time goes on, I found that everybody I've talked to, somebody has another person, another place, another item, another idea that influences their fly fishing that really gets them off, off, of the, uh, off the ground, if you will. That's kind of the background here. We're going to talk about those sort of things. So we all know that Susan's a busy, busy person here with all the stuff she's got going on. But we're going to go back in time a little while uh, and pick up uh, just some of the influences. There's, there's two or three that we want to talk about here. So let's start with the first one. If you had to look back, who would be probably one of your biggest, earliest influences? Um, well, that's an easy one, um, and that would be my dad. So from, I guess, some of my very earliest childhood memories, um, I was fishing. Not fly fishing, but just traditional um, fishing with a bobber and a worm or crickets or um, whatever corn, whatever we had at the time. But um, yeah, I can just remember, I mean, just as early as when I was walking, uh, that I was fishing, fishing with Daddy. And it would either be, we go out to the lake sometimes. I was brought up in Bristol. Um, in East Tennessee, and then we moved to the Virginia side. Bristol's a twin city, so we were on both sides of the line. And then I had a lot of family. I was born in Mobile, Alabama. I had a lot of family in Mobile, so we spent a lot of summers um, at uh, Dolphin Island and um, on the on the Gulf. And uh, I can remember many times um, wading out into the surf with my dad and. Um, he would say, "Here's a here's a handful of shrimp. Just put them in your pocket, and we'll walk on out and and fish." And now that I'm thinking about it, that I told him the other day, I said, "What were you thinking? That was crazy. We were like shark bait out there with <laughs> shrimp in our pocket, but there was nothing like catching those uh, those croaker and catfish, and or sitting on the pier with him at Fairhope, Alabama. I've got such great memories of that too. And um, so he was probably." Um, I guess the biggest influence just in my overall um, fishing in general, and I think was the one that really got me hooked on um, on how great that feeling of the tug on the other end of the line would would be. And our parents, our grandparents, our immediate family, they influence us at early ages, and you know you just hope that they bring you into the right stuff and, and kind of get you off on the right foot. It really seems like to, like that's what your parents have done with you is just get you get you set on the right foot, and I guess I'm considering fishing the right foot here. I mean, there's many, many, many other things, but uh, for what we do, you know, that that was like, okay, that's kind of a blessing. 
Well, in my mind, um, he got me off on the right foot, um, first off, just being outside and fishing, but also as introducing me to fly fishing, because um, my dad um, is a retired pastor, and one of the members of the congregation um, invited us to go out fly fishing uh, one weekend. I was living in Virginia Beach at the time, and Robert Shriver lived right on the South Holston uh, River there in Bristol and invited us to come out, and um, he had uh, an extra fly rod I could use, and I borrowed some waders from a co-worker, and it was, I remember we had to be there at like 5.30 in the morning, it was dark, and Robert gave us just a, a real quick lesson, and my dad still says, I felt so sorry for you, you were so awful here, <laughs> as you were casting, that fly was hitting the back behind you, but it didn't matter, because somehow, I don't know how, but somehow that day, I was able to catch a, catch a trout on the fly, and um, I remember walking in the kitchen that night, and I've told this story to a bunch of people, but I walked in the kitchen that night, and Mom said, did y'all have fun? And I said, today changed my life. It absolutely changed. I want to learn every single thing there is to learn about fly fishing. I absolutely loved it. There was just something about um, feeling that, that trout on that lightweight fly rod um, and just feeling every little movement and just bringing it in and just hearing the water rushing around you that, I don't know, I just fell in love with it. And so... That's where it all started, was on that uh, that day on the South Holston uh, River with my dad and with Robert. So really, your fly fishing career started on the South Holston, right? Is that... Yep, that was it. That's yeah. not a bad place to start. No, by no any it means. isn't. <laughs> and it's, it's, it's interesting that he said you were bad. So you obviously have come a long ways uh, in your in your casting ability, because I know that when we fish, I learn something every time. Uh, <laughs> Whenever I turn around and ask, hey, what am I doing wrong here? I'm trying to figure out how to left, cast left hand. And, and Susan was like, oh, you're just you're turning your wrist and you're, the butt <laughs> of the rod's coming in. She didn't add you dummy on the end of it, but she probably could have because, you know, it's something I couldn't see. So, like <laughs> I said, you've come a long way. So, about how old were you, if you don't mind me asking? Oh, gosh, let's see. I would say that was 20 years ago. So, I'm 56 now. So, you can kind of do the math okay. <laughs> from where I was. All right. But, um but I loved uh, just the whole art of casting, and I knew that I had a long, long ways to go, you know, from that. So I just decided that that on that particular day that I was going to do everything I could possibly do to learn about how to cast appropriately and uh, know about the flies, and just uh, I just wanted to do a dive right into it and and get started. So that's what I did. I think a lot of people have started in many different ways, but that's that's a good one with family and and. You know, even if they were just sitting there watching you, my family would be making fun of me. I'm sure yours might have been too. <laughs> <laughs> so as you went on uh, throughout your learning to fly fish and that sort of thing, uh, I, I would assume like the rest of it, you've had some interesting characters uh, kind of influence you and, and bring you into into a whole new spectrum, a whole new realm of the of your of your uh, adventure in fly fishing. Is there anybody else that maybe had 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 an influence on you? Um, yeah, just, um, you know, right after I got started, of course, I, I bought a rod. Um, I didn't know anything about what I was doing. I, I, had, I did hire a guide uh, one time when I was in um, Lynchburg, Virginia, and we went smallmouth fishing, but um, I didn't really, I mean, it was a, a first-time kind of experience. He showed me a little bit about some of the flies for smallmouth, not anything for trout, but um, I got a little bit of casting instruction, but basically I just tried at that point to teach myself, which looking back, I think was probably um, the wrong way to do it. I'm a real believer in going ahead and investing and in getting a casting instructor or, you know, a guy that's really going to show you some things right up front. I believe in that investment, but um, I kind of went about it the hard way. I uh, did a lot of uh, traveling for work, and I was working on a project out in Salt Lake City, and it took me out there for about a year and a half or so, and I was traveling back and forth from uh, Nashville to Salt Lake, and a lot of times I would just stay over on the weekends because I discovered the Middle Provo River, uh, which was in Heber City, just um, less than an hour or so from where I was working there in Salt Lake, 
And one particular evening I was fishing after work and um, this fellow walked along the path and he said, uh, have you ever fished here before? And I said, no. And he said, well, there's nothing there. There's no structure at all there in the water. But um, if you're interested in wanting to learn this forever, you can just follow me. So I kind of followed him along like a little puppy. And he showed me um, showed me some really interesting things that night with um, uh, techniques I had never tried before. Um, you know, I really didn't know what I was doing. I knew nothing about nymph fishing. I was just fishing with a dry fly everywhere I went. And it was, I'm certain was the wrong dry fly to be using for um, for the water that I was fishing. But anyway, um, over that year and a half, I would just meet him there at the river, and his name was Jim Smith. He was um, a surveyor in the area and spent a lot of time after work out there on the water. And so I would get in touch with him and say, I'm headed out that way. And this was back in 2000, uh, 2000 and 2001. And we would meet, gosh, just about at least three or four times a month and um and fish together and he showed me how to um to nymph fish show me how to use a, a strike indicator how to set up a tandem rig how to fish a hopper dropper i mean all those i just could not wait to get out on the river with jim because i knew i was going to learn something else and we would fish on saturdays when i would go out if i didn't fly back to nashville and i would just stay there we would fish from early in the morning until the sun went down just nonstop. I've had the pleasure of seeing a picture of Jim. Now, I didn't have my glasses on at first, so I was, I need you to describe Jim, and if I can describe the picture after that, if you'll just describe Jim to get an idea of what this, this young lady is out in Utah, going up and down the river that, that uh, trying to learn how to fish, and then all of a sudden a guy just walks up out of the blue Yep. Tell me a little bit about what he looks like. So he, he actually has kind of a, probably a Grizzly Adams look to him. Um, he had on a cowboy hat. He had on a, an old worn uh, Filson uh, jacket, um, you know, vest, uh, and a little jacket and his waders, wading boots. Uh, he was carrying a Winston fly rod, uh, and he had a um, had long... Um, gray hair down to about his shoulders, a thick white beard and mustache that was a little bit brown. The little his mustache just about above his lip was brown because he smoked camel cigarettes and, um, and he smelled like cigarettes and uh, and he had a um, a big old black Newfoundland dog that looked like a bear that he would just carry around with him uh, would walk up and down. Um, up and down the river fishing with him so anyway when he hollered out and said well if you want to follow me for the day and I followed him along um I thought well I hope this is an okay thing to do <laughs> but <laughs> I didn't I only thought about it for a second and then I just went right on um but he would always be out there uh on the water uh, with uh, with his truck and had a little camper uh mounted up on the back of his truck and when he would come out to say the weekends he would just stay right there and just sleep overnight in his camper. And um, so that's usually where I'd meet him, right there in the parking lot along the path to the water. And uh, he'd pop out of his camper and um, grab his rod and we'd take off and go fishing. So that was Jim. So was he kind of like the the ultimate, we use this term, it's kind of a marketing term, but was he kind of the ultimate trout bum back in those oh, days? Oh, yeah, yeah. He, he definitely was because... I think when he would get off work on Fridays, he would just drive over to the river and just park his vehicle right there. And um, I don't even think he had a plug-in uh, of any sort. He just he may have had a generator. I don't know if he did, but um, but yeah, that's he just he stayed as long as he could until he had to go back to work. Uh, so he was definitely a trout bum. <laughs> But I sure was lucky to have found him because for whatever reason, I don't know why, he took an interest in me um, as an angler. I remember him saying he was just, he was amazed that I could get there so early and just fish hard all day long until dark. And um, that he'd never seen anything like it. And, and I told him it was because I dream about fly fishing I wake up thinking about it, and I just cannot wait to get on the river. I just remember just how passionate um, 
I, and you know, it's funny because I still feel that way <laughs> when I know I'm going to go fishing the next morning. I still get that excited, just like it was back then um, when I was fishing with him. But yeah, he was definitely a trout bum. On one of our trips, he said, um, you know, you should look up a couple of people. Um, he said, have you ever heard of um, a woman named Lorianne Murphy with Real Women or Joan Wolf?" So Jim told you to look up Lorianne Murphy. You looked up Lorianne, you went out to her school. That's right. Real women. Real women. It's called. And then he also told you to look up Joan Wolf, uh, who's a legend. And you looked up Joan Wolf and did you tell me what happened then? Well, he had just mentioned that he thought that she had a um a fly fishing school, you know, a casting school, or he thought that. And if I looked online, I'd probably find it. Well, I did. Sure enough, I looked it up. And um, and actually, when I was out in um, at the Real Women's School, I talked to Lori Ann about it. And she was like, oh, yes, Joan, it's fabulous. If you have a chance to go out through one of the classes, you know you should do it. So, so, so right there, I mean, you, you've had Jim, then Lori Ann, and as people start, they start shaping you as an angler right there and you don't really know what's coming, but now you've, now you've had someone take them under your, take you under their wing, someone to put you through school and now you're moving on to Joan Wolf. Yeah. Yeah. That's it was really, incredible. it was really something. And honestly, I didn't realize the significance of, um, you know, of, of being connected with Lori Ann. Um, you know, is, who was pretty well known in the industry. And then, of course, Joan, who was a legend. I didn't realize at the time the significance of all of that because I was just getting into fly fishing and I, I really knew nothing. You know, I, I was just learning. So um, so I really wasn't phased, I don't guess, by um, by being there or being around uh, Lori Ann. I mean, she was a teacher and a great teacher. I didn't realize, um, you know, how well known she was, and especially, um, you know, the significance too of, of getting ready to uh, to be out at the Wolf School. But um, anyway, I did look up the school, and um, it was. I remember getting on um, to go to the the casting school, and the way that they run the program uh, at the Wolf School. There's uh, the trout school, there's a casting school, and then there's also an instructor school. So I went through the um, the casting school. It's a long weekend. You fly in on a Friday afternoon. The class starts Friday evening. Um, you go uh, Friday evening all day Saturday, and then um, until five o'clock on Sunday. And at the time, Floyd Frankie was the uh, was the director of the school, and um, he has since um, passed away. But just a fabulous guy, and um, and then Joan and the two of them. Um, just you know, managed the school with a, a few instructors uh, that did some hands-on teaching as well. So I went through the casting class. I absolutely loved it, and so I signed up uh, that fall to go through the instructor school. And of course, you know, all this time I'm thinking that I really want to come back to Nashville and um, and start um, guiding and instructing. But I wanted to have all this under my belt before I did it. And I wanted to have some credibility you know, with my teaching, and I thought, well, if I can go to a reputable, you know, guide school, if I can go to get some really good casting instruction, and then go through an instructor school, then that should, you know, that should do it. Well, during the instructor school, probably the most nerve-wracking experience I've ever had was when I had to teach the roll cast in front of Joan and in, and in front of Floyd, sitting there on a bench, I had I was one of the instructors, just like all of us had to. We had to get up, stand at the pond, and then go through how we would instruct a student, and then we were critiqued on how well we did and things that we need to work on, and um, and it was nerve wracking. You know, I, I felt like I was 
uh, had really accomplished something once I got through that, uh, that one piece of instruction. But um, I must have done okay because um, the next year uh, I got a letter and uh, Floyd and Joan had invited me to come back to be an intern at the school. And I, I think I just danced around the room when I read that letter. <laughs> so uh, I definitely did it. I went back and uh, interned and that just meant that you were um, part of the staff and as other students, you know, 20 some students would come through the weekend. Uh, you would just assist the other instructors around the pond and helping people know how to hold the rod and, you know, just go through the the various um, uh, portions of, of the school with them. Um, and then from there, it just led to a, um, a position that opened up, and uh, I've been teaching now at the school for the last 14 years. And, you know, each one of us um, has a turn at different portions of, of the school in different sections that we teach, whether it's on, um, you know, the, um, your leader, the preparation of your leader and your tippet to, uh, talking about different, uh, fly lines and fly line design and weights to teaching the roll cast or, um, or the basic cast or demonstrations and things like that. But, um, but I absolutely love it. And one of the things I like best is that the instructors that are there have been there for a long time. Uh, Sheila Hassan is now the director of the Wool School since um, since Floyd passed away. But Joan, um, she still comes into the class and uh, works uh, with each of the students, sometimes in the evenings, um, sometimes in the afternoons around the pond. But it's always a thrill when she walks in and everybody's excited to see her and have a chance to meet her. She is um, 91 and is looks amazing. Um, still will get out there and cast for folks. Um, takes your arm um, and guides your cast just to show you exactly um, how the rod should feel and how the cast should feel. Um, you know, it's she is just an amazing instructor, and I have learned so much from her. And really, it feels like the whole Wolf School, the um, the environment there with the other instructors, because we've known each other and worked together for so long. Um, it feels like every spring when we get together, it's like a little mini family reunion. We walk in, Joan hugs all of it. I mean, it's really like a family. Um, we can't wait to see each other. It's been a year, so we, you know, catch up on all the stuff that's been happening. Um, some of us are full-time um, instructors and guides. Some of us have part-time jobs and, you know, just do it on the side. But we all have the one thing in common is that it, we have a true, true passion uh, for casting, and um, and we love it, and we can't wait to uh, to show the students that are there, um, you know, I'll try to rub off our passion on them, but I guess the other thing that's a little bit unusual that you don't see a lot of times with, I think, professionals is that um, we are so close that there's no, like, um, nobody's trying to one-up each other or outdo or there's no competition if somebody stumbles in their lecture or whatever, somebody else is quick to jump up and help them out. It's just a really neat, tight um, uh, group of instructors. In fact, you know, in the 14 years I've been there, um, that's one of the compliments we get at the end of each one of the, the classes, as people will say. It's such a neat group of instructors that everybody seems to get along and love each other, and it's true. It's like a family. But... Um, I remember going up to Joan at the end of one of the schools and uh, telling her, see, I was a civil engineer um, with the with that company, Parsons Brinkerhoff, um, and had been working with them and kind of had risen in the ranks of, of the company and uh, managed actually a region um, at that time. And I told Joan, I said, I think I'm leaving my career and I'm going to start a fly fishing school. And she's like, no, don't quit your day job. Don't do it. Don't do it. <laughs> And um, each year I would come back and I'd say, I think I'm getting closer. And she's like, no, don't, don't do it. And then um, when I finally decided, of course, I had a 10-year plan in place of what I was going to do. And um, I ended a large project and decided, you know, this is a really good time. I've got the school is built. Um, I've gotten most of uh, the assets that I need in place. And... Um, I decided, yeah, I'm just going to do it. So I ended up resigning, and I called Joan and told her, well, I was on my way to the school uh, that spring, and even though she had encouraged me not to do it, she was the first one that um, popped the bottle of champagne 
that evening, that Friday night after our first class, um, first meeting, all the instructors were up at her house, and she's like, I told her not to, but she did it, and I'm so glad she did, and so here's a bottle of champagne, and we're all going to celebrate. So that's a really great memory that I have. And um, Anyway, she's been such a great influence uh, on me in my casting and my instruction, so I definitely had to... Uh, highlight her as the pinnacle of my career so there you go so would you say that your school is is designed somewhat behind after hers or your instruction and all that is that oh there's absolutely no doubt um the uh, it, I, I guess i kind of consider mine as like a, a little mini um wolf school there's so many of the things that we do when i run people through a class here um, because it's ingrained in me if you're going to teach at the wolf school you do it the wolf way i mean it's it's her school. It's uh, it's it, it's just her teaching style and one that that I love. And because I have been teaching that way at the school for so long, it's very easy just to um, incorporate that into all of my teaching as well. So uh, around the pond, when I do my beginning classes, one of the things I like to do is lay out from a two weight all the way up to a ten weight rod and let the students, you know, for just at least a minute. Um, have a little time on each one of those rod weights. And uh, then they're really able to tell the different, the true difference when you cast side by side of a two weight versus a seven weight or a nine weight. You can really tell the differences. And that definitely is something that I borrowed uh, from the Wolf School. And, um, and a lot of the things, like I said, um, it's just where that is a, um, well, from a Friday night to a Sunday afternoon class, uh, mine is uh, is all done in a nine to three uh, Saturday class. So there's some things, of course, that's taken out, but um, but I hit on the high points of mine, and definitely it's the the things I've learned from the school. That is so interesting. That really is interesting. Yeah, really cool. It's, yeah, I love it's, it. it's neat that you start out with your with your your dad. In this case, it's your father takes you fishing, then gets you in one of the well, most well known and, and possibly one of the best rivers in the southeast. Go to the South Holston, you cast a rod. You, as he said, maybe not very good. Um, <laughs> Horrible, I think, was what he said. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but you stick with it. You end up in in Utah. Uh, your work takes you out there. You meet Jim. You fish with Jim off and on for for a good period of time. He says, "Hey, you need to meet." these two people, Lori Ann and Joan, and you do that. And I mean, it's just, it's amazing how this adventure, if you want to call it journey, whatever you want to call it, takes you from person to person to person to experience, from experience to experience to experience. And it's like, it never ends. And you want to know, all right, who's going to be next? Who's going to be the one that, you know, I don't think you ever get to the point where someone doesn't influence you in one way or another, and I think all people probably Oh, sure. Yeah, us. no question about it. Yeah. But, and I think you can learn stuff. I learn even now um, for as, as long as I've been fishing. I'm constant, and that's the thing I like about fly fishing is you always have something new to learn, some new technique, you know, whether it's spay casting or it's um, Euro nymphing whether it's fishing with sinking lines, you know, in, in high water, there's always something um, to learn. It's never ending. So how can it get boring? <laughs> yeah, right. Exactly. Well, Susan, is there anything else you'd like to add that we haven't covered? Um, I guess probably um, just a, a quick thing about our Music City Fly Girls. Um, we just finished our 10th year as a club. Um, this is an all-women's club. Started back in 2007 with um, a good friend of mine, Nikki Mitchell, who um, passed away about four years ago, unfortunately, with pancreatic cancer. Um, she was such a fighter, but and she, I know, would be and is proud of everything that we're doing, but this is an um, all-women's club. We've got about 40, hmm, we run between 40 and 50 members. Uh, we try to meet uh, on the third Thursday of every month. Right now we're meeting at Edley's Barbecue uh, Place on Thursday nights, third Thursday of every month from um, 6 o'clock until 8. We have a dinner and then we have a speaker. A lot of times I'm the default speaker, <laughs> but um, I do call in people like you, David, and um, folks from TWRA and 
uh, the Corps and some other folks just to give some interesting uh, talks. But we do a lot of um, group travel. Uh, we just got back from Panama City Beach. Uh, there were uh, 17 of us that went down to um, do some saltwater fishing. We took a bunch of kayaks and tried our luck at some redfish and um, sea trout. Um, as I mentioned before, we went out to California and fished in the high Sierras. We've done train trips where we popped on a train in Seattle and took that over to Whitefish, Montana, and uh, fished um, on the Flathead and um, fished the San Juan earlier in the year. And it's just a group of women that love to get together and travel. And um, not everybody is an advanced angler, but you know they just they love the group atmosphere. Uh, they don't feel the least bit pressured that they maybe aren't as um, a great a caster as as they want to be, but they love the camaraderie. And, you know, the, our, our only thing is we say that we don't want to have any drama in the club. And, of course, you know, we have some frustration here and there, but everybody loves each other, and um, we're always welcoming new members. And it's probably one of the most, um, I guess, the things that, uh, one thing that I'm most proud of is, is helping to co-found that group and for it to have the longevity that it's, that it's had. Like I said, we're in our 11th year, and one of the main things that we do as a group is our volunteer effort for leading um, the Casting for Recovery retreats uh, every year. We just did our 10th retreat last year, and um, we service uh, 14 women that are breast cancer survivors, teaching them to fly fish. And, of course, uh, David... Um, you have helped us uh, so much over the years in, in leading uh, and recruiting the guides uh, as river helpers for that retreat. But um, I think that activity with Casting for Recovery and the Music City Fly Girls, um, it's just it's one of the things that I'm so proud of. And uh, it's just another offshoot of this path, uh, this fly fishing path that I was without a doubt destined to travel. And um yeah, I'm just, gosh, I am just loving life. What can I say? I guess I could I could tag on at the end of that a couple of different ways is whenever I do get the opportunity to come out and speak about something uh, with the Music City Fly Girls. It's a fantastic atmosphere. They always treat me way better than they probably should. <laughs> they always compliment. They're just, just a really great group of women. So I would say to the folks out there that, if you don't live in Nashville, but you happen to be coming this way, and and you wanna, you know, you wanna sit in on a meeting, I'm sure that they would, that they would, open their arms to you, ladies that may be coming to Nashville for whatever reason. Nashville's not just bachelor parties. There's a lot <laughs> more to do here than a bachelor party for y'all. Uh, so that would be one thing. Just a great group of ladies, and then the casting for recovery. My very small piece, which is very easy for me to do to get the guides together especially send three or four emails and then try to figure out who signed up first to be a guide because we always have all we need plus some backups uh, and people are always willing to help and they just y'all do a fantastic I can't say enough about what y'all do uh, and, and how proud I am to be a very small part of it very oh. small well that's wonderful I appreciate that David and I guess the one last thing I'll just end on I have to put in a little plug is I do have a book that's coming out I had so many great adventures um, that I went on with the Music City Fly Girls and some of the things with Casting for Recovery. Um, that uh, is all wrapped up into, um, that story is wrapped up into an instructional book uh, that will be coming out at the end of next year. Um, I'm nervously excited about that and um, I'll definitely keep you posted on when it hits the shelves. Good news right there. That's good to know. Well, Susan, we appreciate you uh, talking with us today and, and talking about the influence in your life and in your fly fishing life. And thank you for the chili. Uh, it's very good. You are very welcome. And, Anytime. Uh, and, and thank you for having me out. Just You know how much I love this place, and I love coming out here and staying in the campers whenever I yeah. can. So I just really appreciate it. You are welcome. All right. Thanks, everybody. See you next time. <laughs>